We welcome you to this course on microbial keratitis, uh, evidence-based medicine, and I have a galaxy of uh, speakers with me. Uh, Dr. Samar Basak sir from uh, Dishai Hospital, Kolkata. Uh, Dr. Rajesh Sena who will be joining in soon from RP Center for Ophthalmic Sciences, Ames, New Delhi. Dr. Rajesh Fogla from Apollo Hospitals, Hyderabad, and uh, Professor J.S. Titial, Chief RP Center, Ames, New Delhi. So basically, we'll be covering this in the heads that are shown here, and you can ask questions in between if you have any doubts. Uh, coming to the first talk, which is workup uh, work of microbial keratitis and specifically bacterial keratitis. I have no financial interests or ex exclusions, and I think this is uh, bacterial keratitis uh, that we look at in its most devastating form and uh, symptoms we all are aware of and uh, there is nothing much to it except that there can be redness, sensitivity to light which is increased, photophobia, visual acuity which is decreased, pain, discharge and associated conjunctivitis. Now associated conjunctivitis if it is present that means it could be because of gonococci, pneumococci or because of haemophilus. The risk factors could be ocular, such as corneal abrasion or epithelial defect, as is shown here, eyelid disease, contact lens use, previous ocular surgery, ocular surface disease, compromised corneas, and inadvertent use of topical antibiotics, steroids, and traditional eye medicine. Now, uh, risk factors could also be systemic, such as use of immunosuppressive drugs, burns, chronic alcoholism, uh, severe malnutrition, AIDS, malignancy, rheumatoid arthritis, and extremes of ages. These are just to show how you can have, uh, due to the use of traditional eye medicine, such as honey, uh, microbial keratitis, then this is a keratitis after surgery, post LASIK keratitis. And here notice that in these two cases, there is excessive thinning and perforation, and this has occurred mainly because uh, the concomitant use of topical steroids have happened with the antibiotics. So it is important to do a good slit lamp evaluation and look at the area and the density of the infiltration, size and depth of the ulceration, degree of the stromal edema, scleral involvement and anterior chamber reaction if any. And it is important to record this at every visit. Now there is a difference between the size of the epithelial defect and size of the stromal infiltrate. So at every visit you have to look at the size of the stromal infiltrate as well as the size of the epithelial defect and monitor it. And of course, whether the hypopion is fixed or mobile is also important because fixed hypopion uh, is uh, something which is described for fungal keratitis. It is important to know the size, depth of the ulcer infiltrate extent and the scleral, in scleral involvement. It could be less than 2, 2 to 5 or more than 5 millimeters and likewise for the depth in terms of percentage and the infiltrate extent involvement. This is because this is going to determine what antibiotics you are going to give. Now, uh, this is just to show uh, risk factors uh, which were evaluated for severe microbial keratitis and ulcers with poor outcome are more likely to be larger, involve uh, post cornea after aspergillus species or occur in females. This was a study from South India. Now, sometimes you can look at the ulcer and say what it is due to. For instance, if it is a compromised cornea, localized distinct borders, but notice that this cornea is quite clear, that means it is due to staph. But if it is rapidly progressive, serpiginous ulcer with desmet membrane folds, hypopion, deep stromal abscess, and the cornea is edematous all around, then it is because of pneumococcus. Pseudomonas, on the other hand, will have greenish discharge with hypopion, diffuse epithelial grain, Ring ulcer in 48 to 96 hours and desmetocele or perforation in 2 to 5 days. Mycobacteria, on the other hand, has a cracked windshield like appearance. As is seen here, the surrounding cornea is quite clear and there's hardly any AC reaction. Now, sometimes you can have atypical mycobacterial keratitis also after DSEC and LASIC, as is shown here. Morexella tends to be inferior, oval in diabetics and alcoholics and with hardly any AC reaction. And nocardia classically has a cracked windshield-like uh, effect and also has a wreath-like pattern or a flower-like pattern as is seen here. Now, at least three-fourths of the times, clinical examiners can correctly predict what organism it is, but microbiology still remains the mainstay to know what organism it is. And of course, it is important that you do scrapes, which are uh, done from the leading edge and center of the ulcer. And 
classically we like to use a blade for this uh, to do it now if you ask what is the most important stain for a case of microbial keratitis it is koh because that will immediately let you know whether you have to start your antifungal therapy or not however you can do gram stain and acid fast so acid fast is for man and man is mycobacteria ichthyomyces and nocardia Classically, we send cultures for blood agar and chocolate agar, uh, as well as subroj dextrose agar. But in recalcitrant keratitis, you can send send for anaerobic blood agar, LJ media, and non-nutrient agar with E. coli. The culture positivity rate for bacteria is 40 to 73 percent, and everything that is associated with it, which includes a contact lens, contact lens solution, case, uh, suture, if it is there, should be sent for culture sensitivity. now whenever a case of microbial keratitis comes to you then the uh, and the patient is not responding then you have to look what is the cause so if the microbiology report is present then you have to look at the compliance the resistance of the organism and to see whether it's a mixed or a polymicrobial or, uh, entity which is causing it and you are missing out another organism which may be a part of it if the microbiology is not available and the ulcer is not responding then stop antibiotics for 12 hours at least rescrape and send for special stains and culture if it is a twice negative smear case then you have to do a corneal biopsy sometimes you it you may get it after surgery such as like this post lk keratitis then you have to get this infiltrate after removing the suture or post lasik keratitis then you have to lift up the flap and then again send it for scrape at times it could be a dsec graft so little piece from the dsec graft has to be sent or there may be no infiltrate present as such but abscess is there and because there's no epithelial defect then you do a short suture biopsy take a needle with a short suture pass it through this and send it for culture and sensitivity like i said earlier corneal biopsy for at least twice negative cases should be done with no clinical improvement and the tissue is removed end block after doing a partial thickness trephination now the treatment strategies are fairly simple uh, if there are mild ulcers less than 3 mm in size not involving the visual access it is monotherapy which could be oflox ciprofloxs cataflox moxiflox and now more lately we are using uh, levoflox 1.5% but if there are moderate ulcers more than 3 mm in size involving the visual axis you have to start with a combination therapy which could be kefazulin 5% fortified with tobramycin 1.3% uh, or with ciprofloxacin 0.3% so that it covers for both the gram positive and the gram negative organisms now uh, the drops at least for the initial 48 hours have to be given round the clock which means even during the night time now this is just to show that although it is said that the fluoroquinolones will not cause uh, resistance but off late we are finding cases where resistance is there and uh, again something uh, that is uh, really worrisome uh, is the resistance and there is a need to look at other drugs and other uh, targets as well these were the two studies randomized control study in mild to moderate corneal ulcer where uh, which looked at 200 plus patients uh, from our center and where we showed that you could use monotherapy in mild to moderate keratitis this is how the fortified uh, cefacillin drops are pre prepared and uh, for, uh, fortified tobramycin drops are prepared for severe cases of microbial uh, bacterial keratitis and likewise sometimes you may have to uh, use vancomycin in these cases or amikacin or trimethoprim and uh, uh, this is the way we have to prepare it and the concentrations thereof now uh, adjunctive therapy continues in the form of cyclopyrigix anti glaucoma medications and systemic antibiotics were classically indicated for perforations post perforation scleral involvement and neisseria and hemophilus the scut trial which was done from the arvind eye hospital steroids for corneal ulcer trial did clearly show that non nocardia keratitis or severe pseudomonas keratitis did better with with topical steroids so what did it teach us it it taught us that topical steroids may be started Uh, provided you have a culture and sensitivity report in hand and loading dose of antibiotics have been given for 48 hours 
but they should never be started for fan that means fungal keratitis atypical mycobacteria keratitis and nocardia keratitis so if the ulcer is healing then you do nothing about it but if it is not healing then look for other bacteria and other factors uh, whether these are uh, there or not specific antibiotics have to be given for specific organisms so for mrsa vancomycin for severe pseudomonas keratitis ciftazidim for mycobacteria fortitum killoni amikacin and likewise for nocardia amikacin and trimethoprim can be given uh, these are the ao recommendations from 2018 and these are essentially the drugs that we've already talked about now antibiotic resistance is a reality and if you put it in the pubmed you see that it is going on increasing uh, and there is a exponential rise in the recent years fluoroquinolone resistance is known and uh, resistance these are the several reports where resistance is to these uh, uh, antibacterials is there so what do you what do we do we can use new combination formulations like topical piperacillin linozolid colistin imipenem peptas and uh, increased use of vancomycin when mrsa is suspected and these are the doses of linozolid colistin and amipenem uh, which can be given uh, a single case report of topical colistin which uh, which led to the uh, healing of uh, bacterial keratitis and the method of preparation is uh, shown here and likewise piperacillin can be used now there are newer fungal newer fluoroquinolone treatments which are available uh, and these are the ones but none that are commercially available uh, i would just like to talk about uh, levofloxacin 1.5% which is commercially available which is concentrated and which has a stronger potency so you don't have to uh, make it in your ocular pharmacy uh, pharmacy now this uh, significantly uh, reduces the colony counts and especially the pseudomonas and this is of course a single case report but we have an ongoing study uh, on combination therapy versus uh, levofloxacin in cases of microbial keratitis again uh, mild to moderate and uh, this is with uh, lvpi both the both the centers are in collaboration for this so how do you prevent resistance don't use don't taper the antibiotics you have to stop it short i mean once it is healed then you have to just stop it you cannot you know give it four times a day and then three times a day and then two times a day and once a day because that is going to cause resistance so don't use sub therapeutic dose use the curative dose then using the right, right antibiotic is important and use of uh, use of antibiotics when proved to be use it only when it is useful don't use it uh, just as a prophylactic therapy now a uh, word about pack cxl uh, or collagen cross linking for infectious keratitis uh, this has also been tried with the uh, with the rose bengal dye but uh, as of now uh, there is no real role of uh, collagen cross linking in microbial keratitis at least uh, this is the meta analysis which shows that there is insufficient evidence uh, for the same uh, just to conclude i would like to talk about deep learning algorithms for diagnosing bacterial keratitis via the external eye photographs and i think ai is something or artificial intelligence is something that is uh, going to uh, going to rather say shouldn't say uh, rule us but going to guide us uh, in the diagnosis of uh, keratitis so it is important to rewind reevaluate and redefine our approach especially when uh, resistance is there and these are the sequel complications which can uh, occur if not treated well but this should be the healing of a bacterial keratitis if treated well and this is what we should look for with hardly any haze and hardly any vascularization so this is a book on corneal ulcers the second edition of which is going to be out soon and thank you very much for your kind attention
what happened so thank you yeah. so uh, dr rajesh fogla can you please come on the dais huh so uh, we have covered the workup of a case of microbial keratitis as well as bacterial keratitis if there is a question uh, we can take it uh, just now uh, before uh, dr samar basak uh, starts his talk on fungal keratitis anybody wants to ask anything so so there are two things for any antibiotics one is a prophylactic dose and other is the curative dose so suppose you are giving moxifloxacin after cataract surgery that is a prophylactic dose so you give moxifloxacin four times a day and then after a week or after four days whatever your protocol is you stop it now uh, uh, the the when you give it for corneal ulcer you start one hour early but you can taper after say 48 hours so that is still curative that is still curative so what i mean is that for cataract surgery you should not do like this four times a day three times a day two times a day once a day because that is going to that is going to cause resistance likewise for corneal ulcer the uh, the curative uh, frequency say for moxis floxacin would be four times a day so whenever you think it has resolved you just stop it at that time so for tobramycin also it's a qid dose which is uh, tobramycin also it will be like a qid dose where you will stop it sir so it's a pleasure to request uh, dr samar basak from deshai hospital kolkata to talk on fungal keratitis standard medical therapy intrastromal and intracameral injections thank you namrata and uh, this is the uh, course running for several years and i'm honored that uh, this uh, uh, you have covered the bacterial keratitis now i'll be covering the parts of fungal keratitis i do not have any financial interest to disclose so in the developing countries the most of the reports come from the tertiary center and uh, predominantly fungal or mixed in tertiary level standard treatment is always based up on microbiology workup you have seen that on the other hand in small clinic or setup mostly they are primary cares and in many situation the treatment is empirical but mind that for empirical management you must have more knowledge than if you have a microbiology report in your hand so knowledge about clinical presentation of different types as already mentioned like different types of fungal keratitis geographical differences in of the causative organism in various part of the country like aspergillus or fusarium like east our part it is aspergillus or southern india it is mostly fusarium urban versus rural urban that is mostly of candida but rural pet is mostly of filamentous then predisposing factor like it is due to paddy field injury or it is due to onion field it onion is more of fusarium paddy field more of aspergillus so everything should be kept in mind before starting empirical management and uh, sensitivity pattern of specific antifungal in that area that is also important something which works in uh, eastern india may not work in northern india or southern india 
those are also important. So, start empirical treatment, but be rational. See your response for 48 or 72 hours. If it responds, then you continue the treatment. If it is not, then refer to a specialist who has microbiology backup and other support. So, this AIOS guideline was long time back where you need to know everything about size, location, depth, presence of hypopion and its amount. And what Dr. Namrata has stressed that if you do only one microbiology, that is KOH mount, that will differentiate one large group that it is non-fungal or fungal. There are antifungals, we know the pollens, azoles are there. Surprisingly, in the world, the only, only one tested antifungal drop is available, FDA approved, that is natamycin. That was about 50 years back. No other antifungal has been produced by any company, which we are using as antifungal. Those are all off-level drug. There are some sensitive pattern like amphotericin B is more sensitive to aspergillus, not so in fusarium. Likewise, natamycin is more sensitive to fusarium and also it is sensitive to other drugs. Natamycin is that way, its spectrum is good, but less in aspergillus kind of drug. So, uh, other uh, azole is like ketaconazole, fluconazole, itraconazole, recently voriconazole drop we are having, and but other are using for as uh, uh, oral preparation. So, key points to remember that all available antifungals are fungistatic in nature, not fungicidal. Natamycin is the drug of choice in filamentary keratitis, especially in fusarium. Due to poor penetration, it is only effective in non-severe, more superficial keratitis. Amphotericin B is effective against candida and aspergilla species, but less effective in fusarium. Fluconazole show good activity against candida. So for better penetration, you need to scrape the cornea. If it is a deep fungal abscess, then you need to give, scrape it deeper, maybe you need to do stab incision also. So, that is why roll of scraping and debridement, it is a must. Repeat scraping is again, it is a must, depending upon the response. It helps in decreasing the microbial load and also helps for penetration of topical antifungal. And in dermatitious fungus, probably you need to scrape it every alternate day because it is very difficult to scrape the superficial pluck. Then initial management is monotherapy. So monotherapy, there are certain guidelines that less than 5 millimeter, or less than one third hypopion or no hypopion. So natamycin is the first, initially half an hourly for 24 hours, then hourly. Then if you know that it is aspergillus, so amphotericin B, you can also start. Again, same concentration. Bodiconazole is the third choice, cycloplegic, antibiotic. Review initially every second day, third day, then weekly depending upon the response. And depending upon the response, you can do the tapering of the doses or you may add a second antifungal. Smart trial has shown that the uh, uh, topical natamycin treatment is significantly better than topical boriconazole. This is a wonderful uh, study. Then this is a one thing uh, uh, will be available from RP center. This is water soluble natamycin. It is 0 .0, uh, point, uh, one percent. Natamycin is five percent. This is one percent and. Uh, they have uh, already published and uh, both topical and intrastromal injection in recalcitrant fungal infection. Probably Namrata will answer some of your question with this 
a newly developed product from All India Institute. So combination therapy are for one eyed patients for ulcers more than 5 mm, endothelial plaque, endoexudate, or presence of hypopion, scleral involvement. Maybe you can wait for 10 14 days with monotherapy, then you, it is not effective, then you start for with the combination therapy. The combination of natamycin is natamycin and boriconazole is better because you are giving one pollen group and one azole group, but amphotericin and natamycin may not be good because both are pollen group, both may not be synergistic or additive action. So, role of systemic antifungals are there, like one-eyed patient, again, scleral involvement, threaded perforation, the preferred oral antifungals are fluconazole, cletoconazole, iatroconazole, boriconazole in doubtful and most expensive. And you need to know the toxicity of systemic antifungal, sometimes they are dangerous. So you have to see certain uh, blood parameter when you are giving this tablet or injection to the patient. Again, MART trial 2 have shown that, that if you are using topical natamycin and topical voriconazole, oral voriconazole probably will not help much. So it, 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 it is not so effective except in few cases of fusarium keratitis. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't have any uh, benefit from oral vodinkarazole. So how long is to continue antifungal? This is a tricky question because you you see from superficial the ulcer is healed, everything, no staining, nothing, but difficult to judge. But rule of thumb is if you think that it is healed, continue treatment for another two weeks and see, ask the patient to come back after two weeks and review the case there may be some recurrence because the filaments may travel to the angle and again they can come forward. Then the targeted therapy, intracameral or intrastremal injection, if there are certain indication for it and you have to remove the, uh, uh, the hypopion, thick hypopion it and take a 30 gauge needle and you just surround that lesion from all sides, be careful not to penetrate whole cornea and this you may have to repeat again and again depending upon the response. But there are a lot of anecdotal reports with the intracameral intrastromal injection and uh, there are some says it is acting, some says it is not acting. But again, the study, this is a randomized control trial from RP Center by Namrata. And they said that intracameral anphobi doesn't offer benefit over topical antifungal therapy when performed alone or in association with drainage of hypopion. But we have seen certain cases do response, like I said earlier, they after some of the cases, maybe it is beneficial. Then intracameral boriconazole, and you remember the pharmacokinetics of intracameral boriconazole, half-life is only 22 minutes inside the anterior chamber. So you need to repeat it every day probably. And again, there are certain anecdotal reports. It is good, it is bad. But people, when it is associated with endophthalmitis or even the retina people are using intravitreal boriconazole nowadays. And it has got some role. Intrastromal amphobi, intrastromal boriconazone, which is better, again, anecdotal, lot of reports are there, are some uh, good, bad, but again, the randomized trial from, these are good studies from RP Center that you, you know the result actually. So intrastromal boriconazole didn't provide additional benefit over topical boriconazole. So, but we have seen, yes, this is my patient, and you see that both combination of rap intrastromal boriconazole and intrastrom, intracameral amphobi, and two, two, two consecutive uh, five days interval patient, this ulcer respond very nicely. There are reports also in some journal, like 
if you have an interface small exudate, now what will you do? This, because the graft is absolutely clear, but just give a stab incision there with a need leave, try to scoop out the infiltrate material. Now if you give inter interface injection of bodyconazole or amphobi, probably it will end, you can save the graft actually. So there are another report from RP center that uh, that uh, randomized control trial of inje intrastromal injection of bodyconazole, amphotericin B and natasol. And they have shown that intrastromal natamizer has a similar and faster healing than uh, probably uh, than amphotericin A. Probably we will be looking for that in future. So in summary, some study says that it does work and in conjunction but needs repeat injection. Complication like UVIT, secondary glaucoma, iris neovascularization and subsequently there will be bleeding during, lot of bleeding during therapeutic keratoplasty. And there is no advantage of giving intrastomal voriconazole. Intrastomal works better in probably only in Canada. And you probably give it, this is the my final slide that this is a nice uh, algorithm uh, how to go with fungal ulcer that topical systemic and targeted therapy in mycotic keratitis and this is from again from Namrata. He, he, she has a huge work on this and this was published in Cornea Jungle. I request you all that you must go through this article and there is a beautiful flow chart and how will you go before before going for therapeutic keratoplasty. Thank you very much for your patience here. Thank you so much, sir. If there are any questions, we can uh, take the questions on bacterial or fungal keratitis. So there are no questions either. Everything is too clear or... <laughs> I have a question. When, when will Netasol be commercialized? So, Netasol is a, actually corneal ulcer is a disease of the poor. And the problem is that uh, Netamycin is in rate contract. So, when a drug is in rate contract, then uh, they don't earn much review, the revenue, the companies. So, we've talked to two, three companies and uh, they've all uh, looked at the proposal, but they've not gotten back. And finally, I think... Uh, so, in India, probably if you go back to study from Madurai and other part, that probably every year we have more than one million, one million fungal corneal ulcer. So, company people do not realize this. So, it is a big business. You, you give, give, give to us. We, we will go for it. So, you see that there is no business in natamycin in antifungal because the natamycin is the only product FDA approved in 76, 76. And no other antifungal came in the market because fungal ulcer is not happening in western world. So only in developing country, India is China, Bangladesh, Nepal, Myanmar. These are the five countries where the fungal ulcer is hugely prevalent. That's why company people are not interested to bring all these things. So, I want to ask one question. How many of us here in the hall have a microbiology setup or have access to microbiology in case uh, you need to scrape? So, that is quite a lot. So, at least that part is taken uh, care of. How many of us have uh, set up for doing therapeutic grafts? So, again, that is also not bad, actually. So, one, one, uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> no, no, quite right. I think uh, we are trying to, the, the, the comment was that 
since we are in delhi so dcgi can be influenced uh, for uh, for netasol datamycin so that it is not in rate contract so i think uh, that is something which we will need to work to but still having said this microbial keratitis and antifungals are not not a very big market for companies so that is uh, that is the real reason i would ask like to ask dr basak one question uh, yeah, before that i want to have one yes, comment yes yes one comment about microbiology backup the, there are two difference if you are doing the scraping yourself according to our guideline and put it in the media like at least two medias or you are sending the patient to the microbiology clinic or microbiology setup to take a scrape and do the whatever the two media or three media the result will be different so scrape yourself only take their help of otherwise the yield will be much less from them if you do it yourself at least KOH if you do it is it's it is almost 98 percent positive in your hand if you clinically think it is fungal you do scrape see under micros one drop of KOH that is enough so I, the question that i had was that how do you although in in a randomized study it has been shown that debridement in fungal keratitis is not of much use but what do you think is the role of debridement in, it, it is required it is required depending upon the depending about the depth of the ulcer depth of the ulcer and epithelial healing pattern so when epithelium is healed, there is a much large infiltrate inside. It is better to debride it because drug has to penetrate. Unless you debride the epithelium, no antifungal penetrate the cornea tissue and act. And fungal, you know, the filament are fungal. They are horrible, unlike the bacteria. They go and they penetrate the DM and hypopion at least 50 to 70 percent they also contain filaments so it has to be reached there yeah one caveat for debridement is that sometimes the fungal keratitis will make the stroma slightly softer mm. and if you become very aggressive in your debridement you will be taking away a big chunk of the stroma as well because you are able to scrape that off if you did that maybe the chance of perforation can be higher so just do a gentle debridement gentle, to remove only gentle the superficial. Gentle debridement is what is generally advocated. Okay, so I think we'll go to the next part and next part is very important. At least the first part is very important. Of course, uh, Rajesh will say that DALC is also very important. It is. But gluing part is very important because that is something which can be done in the clinics by everyone. So over to Rajesh. Thank you, Namrata. And I think this is a very important instruction course. and. We, we do conduct it every year. Now, talking about the glue, we refer to the cyanoacrylate glue, which is either isobutyl or isoamyl cyanoacrylate. Uh, it's used for closing of incisions and lacerations in general surgery. And here, uh, we can use it to seal perforations as well. It has a bactericidal effect as well. It's a liquid monomer, which when it comes in contact with moisture, it polymerizes and rapidly uh, forms like a strong adhesive. Now, when you are treating a corneal ulcer, there are instances where the ulcer can perforate uh, during the course of the treatment, resulting in uh, you know leakage of aqueous and a shallow anterior chamber. So you need to seal this perforation, and up to two millimeter diameter of perforation can be effectively sealed using the cyanoacrylic glue. So you use a small plastic disc of two to three millimeter, you can cut a cotton bud, put some ointment, and then uh, touch the plastic disc, and then put a drop of cyanoacrylic glue. Put an air bubble in the anterior chamber so that prevents the seepage of fluid. Remove the surrounding epithelium or any kind of exudate that's sticking at the site of the perforation. Otherwise, the glue will stick to the epithelium and it will fall off rapidly. So basically, you need to have bare stroma around. And once you have done that, dry the surrounding conjunctiva as well because any contact will rapidly poly polymerize. On the dry surface, bring the disc at the site of perforation and then gently apply with the cotton bud uh, which has a, some ointment sticking on it. So it releases the disc pretty quickly. Uh, wait for uh, 
a few minutes, you can apply some antibiotic drops, and then that plastic disc can be easily removed, or even if you left it behind, it wouldn't matter, but in most cases, we remove the, the plastic disc that you have. And this ensures that you have a smoother surface. If you were to directly apply the glue, it will still work, but it'll leave a very irregular anterior surface, which can be irritating. But if you use a plastic disc, you ensure that you have a nice, smooth, flat surface. Any excess uh, glue which is spread out can be trimmed using a pair of scissors or a forceps. And if you see, that's how it looks in the immediate post-operative period. And later on, that perforation is sealed, leave, leaving behind some vascularization as well. If you leave the glue for a longer period of time, it does tend to bring in blood vessels. Now, surgical intervention is necessary when there is no response to the maximum medical therapy. There is a rapid progression despite the uh, medications that you're giving or the tectonic integrity of the eye is compromised. Traditionally, we do therapeutic keratoplasty, but the, what we will touch upon is, is there a role of lamellar keratoplasty? The advantage of doing a lamellar keratoplasty is that you do a closed chamber surgery, you don't open the globe, and you retain the host endothelium, which ensures that the graft can survive longer because the endothelium is preserved. Uh, so, but the disadvantage is that because you, you, there is a possibility you may leave behind some amount of infective material and the risk of recurrence can be higher. Now, this is a paper back from 2002, a China study from China, where they looked at doing lamellar keratoplasty in a series of 55 uh, cases of fungal keratitis. But you look at it, they did just waited for seven days and no response to medical therapy. They went in for lamellar keratoplasty, mostly filamentous fungi, and uh, almost 93% of them had a favorable outcome and four cases had requir recurrence requiring penetrating keratoplasty. This is another study from uh, Italy, from Italy uh, in 2017. It was published where again, here, the duration of treatment was slightly longer, 15 to 50 days, but limited to the central cornea and uh, up to a depth of about 300 microns. So not very advanced fungal keratitis. They used both the big bubble and a manual dissection, and they ensured that the, in the histopath, there was no involvement of uh, beyond the tissue that was excised. They had no recurrences and no graft failure in their series. Uh, this is another paper, again, published from a series from China, where they looked at the role of big bubble uh, deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty for deep fungal keratitis. So it was occupying more than four-fifths of the cornea. So they did have some complications like double anterior chamber or perforation. But the recurrence rate was, again, less, th less than 10%, only about 8.7%. That means about in about 90, 92% of the eyes, you could salvage the eye by doing a lamellar keratoplasty alone. And this is one of their cases. You can see there is a severe fungal keratitis involving the central cornea, which was managed effectively using a lamellar keratoplasty. Now, this is a comparative study between the therapeutic DALC and a therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty for bacterial, fungal, or acanthamoeba keratitis not responding to medical therapy. Uh, the success rate of uh, the surgery was similar in both eyes, but out of the recurrences in therapeutic keratoplasty, uh, six developed endophthalmitis with very poor outcomes. And if you look at the best corrected visual acuity, a greater percentage achieved a 6-9 uh, following therapeutic DALC. And the graft survival was also better when you performed a therapeutic DALC. For other indications like acanthamoeba keratitis, where we have limited antimicrobial agents, and we know that sometimes you need to continue with the treatment for a long duration of time. Uh, here in 11 eyes, they performed the DALC for acanthamoeba keratitis, and they continued with the anti amoebic therapy both uh, before and after, and the involvement was again less than 300 microns. They performed both the decimatic DALC and the pre-decimatic DALC, and they had good visual outcome without any recurrences. Now, this is again another paper from L.B. Prasad where they looked at the severity of the acanthamoeba keratitis. So if the infiltrate was larger than 8 millimeter, it was advanced keratitis, and less than 8 millimeter, it was uh, less uh, severe. And when they look, you look at the complications, you realize that the complications are much higher when you do in advanced keratitis. Almost 60% of the graft failed, and in less severe keratitis, the graft failure rate was only 15%. And so one year survival uh, and the eradication of infection was higher in the less severe cases. So the conclusion was that uh, it, it, a DAL could perform better when you treat uh, acanthamoeba keratitis, which are less than eight millimeter. So the 
take home message for acanthamoebic keratitis with, is that don't wait for the infection to begin by advance or go all the way up to the limbus because then eradication of infection becomes more difficult. This is one of such cases where we are doing a dark surgery. So you can see that severe acanthamoebic keratitis where we did the initial trephination, debulked the cornea, injected air to try and created a big bubble. Uh, we created a type 2 bubble which was deflated and then we went ahead and excised the residual stroma after putting some viscoelastic to separate the layers. The viscoelastic was washed out and the graft was placed in position. That's the end of surgery. And that's how the patient looked the next day. You can see that the graft looks clear. And we continued with the anti amoebic therapy for at least three weeks post-surgery. This is another patient with acanthamoeba keratitis. You can see the ring infiltrate where a big bubble dark was done and the patient had a favorable outcome. You can do microsporidial keratitis, which is very rare infection, but we don't have an effective antimicrobial therapy. So even in this case, this is a case report back from 2009 where they had a successful outcome performing a DALC. This is one of my patients who had uh, stromal uh, microsporidiosis, which was diagnosed and treated as uh, stromal herpetic keratitis with steroids, with waxing and waning of symptoms, and even undergone a cataract surgery. So when at the time when we saw we went ahead and did the uh, deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. We were able to successfully create the big bubble in this case, excise the residual stroma, and that's what the outcome was. You can see the the uh, the microsporidic or organisms in the histopathology, and you can see the post-op. The graph looks very clear, but it doesn't work the same. This is another patient where we attempted a lamellar keratoplasty, but we ended up with recurrence in the interface where we had to go back and do a full thickness keratoplasty. This is another patient with no cardiac keratitis, not responding to therapy. This is following SMILE, and you can see in the interface. Uh, so here also, uh, instead of doing a penetrating keratoplasty, a lamellar keratoplasty was done where a big bubble was created, and we managed to complete the surgery, and that's the post-operative outcome. If you have perforation uh, during the treatment of ulcer, so this was a case which had a a uh, severe infection was treated with glue BCL followed by amniotic membrane, and you can see involving the visual axis, wanted better vision, penetrated, instead of doing a penetrating keratoplasty, despite having a two millimeter perforation, a manual DALC was done, and you can see a month later, he improved to six, nine, and still has good endothelial cell count. So basically, in conclusion, thera therapeutic keratoplasty is essential to eradicate infection and maintain integrity of the globe in microbial keratitis, which are not responding to medical therapy. Uh, here, for lamellar keratoplasty, the timing of intervention is critical. If you wait till the infection has gone too deep or spread laterally to go all the way to the limbus, uh, maybe it would be the success, the success of lamellar keratoplasty would be limited. Uh, but you need to continue with the perioperative antimicrobial therapy. And this can be guided by the tissue that you excise and what microbiology tells you. The advantage of DALC is that you may have better survival of the graft and you can avoid the use of steroids in the post-operative period. So basically, in your surgical uh, considerations, you should keep uh, DALC as one of the options and uh, just remember that you have to continue with the antimicrobial therapy to prevent recurrence. Thank you. Thank you for a patient hearing. Thank you. If there are any questions uh, related to so whenever there is a perforation or impending perforation, you advocate glue. Uh, what else, like in the COVID situation? Uh, no, depending on the size of the perforation and location of the perforation, because if the perforation is close to the visual axis, sometimes uh, putting a glue means you will end up with a scar. So you look at other options which you can resolve the vision also for the patient. But if it's in the periphery and outside the visual axis, glue is a good option. And sometimes, depending on what infection you're dealing with, also you, you want to buy more time because if it's an infection for which you don't have an effective therapy and you go ahead and try to do a surgery at the same time, the chance of recur the recurrence of infection may be higher. So maybe you want to get rid of the infection completely and seal with the glue first. So, so uh, once you put the glue, and uh, at times it comes out on its own, but sometimes it, it, it doesn't come out. So for how long will you let the glue remain there? Well, ideally till complete resolution of infection and the eye has become completely quiet. And most of the time, uh, if the underlying surface has healed well, the glue will dislodge. 
but at times I have gone ahead and if the, the, like the, the glue is not completely tight, but it's moving. I've tried to tease it off, but remember that sometimes you may tease it off, but there may be an underlying small tiny perforation. So you may you have to go back and put again a small amount of glue material again. Because it tends to bring in a lot of blood vessels and you know, yeah, and you're not able to image behind the glue. Even if you were tried to do an OCT to see whether the posterior surface is healed, there's so much of back shadowing that there is no way for you to figure out what's happening. It, yeah, it just gives a very vague idea, but, but yes, can't be very sure. Correct. But people have managed these non-infective perforations by putting in a small desec graph from inside as well. So there's a nice paper published, I think, in BG or I, where they have taken a small disc of, uh, you know, lenticule and they have pasted it from inside with an air bubble. So instead of always going from the front, you can seal the perforation from inside as well. So uh, do you think uh, uh, you can, can you use a tenon patch graft in cases of... If it is larger uh, than 2 millimeter, then yes, where you cannot put a glue, a tenon patch graft is more effective. But remember that if there is infection surrounding area and you put a tenon patch graft, sometimes you will not, because the tenon patch graft is whitish in color, unlike cyanocrylate, which yeah. has some antimicrobial properties, this one may not have. Doesn't so have. you will not be able to ascertain whether there is a persistence of infection or, you know, clinical judgment may become a little bit more difficult when you put in a tenon patch graft and you put sutures, overlay sutures when you put tenon patch graft. If the surrounding stroma is not very, if it's softer, your sutures will cheese wire, you may have more difficulty in managing that. I think. Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh. Are there any questions from the, yes. Yes, Dr. Shakin Singh. By putting glue, he has demonstrated that we should put air in that ear chamber. Is yes. it safe to put the air in that ear chamber in an infected surface for the epithesis? I, I didn't hear. So, yes. air in the anterior chamber. While applying glue, you demonstrated one step before that that you should put air in the yeah, anterior chamber. Yeah, that I showed in my video that you always have to put an air in the anterior chamber so to dry the surface. The question is, if it is moist, putting, if we are putting air, the surface is already infected. Is it a risk of carrying infection inside instead of a glue going inside, which is a safer than an infection? You can make a paracentesis away from the infection you, in a normal cornea and you're just putting an air bubble because if you did not put an air bubble, your glue not only will go into the anterior chamber, it may polymerize much faster before it has an, yeah. had an opportunity to, uh, you know, in the area where you want to apply. And also you will have the iris getting stuck to the inner surface of the wound. Sir, so when we inject air, we inject it through the area which is absolutely clean. clean. Absolutely so the, clean. So uh, thinking it's clean because when the infection is you there, you can put iodine yeah. on the surface and it's you can to spread all over the surface. Uh, <laughs> it, Not really. Uh, it, it usually works well because mo when you make a stab, you make it from an area which is yeah, clean. Yeah, so inject clean air before, and then you yeah. So but yes, uh, I mean there the is, risk is no, anything when, when there yeah. is a perforation. There is already an access to the anterior yeah. chamber. So yeah. how does it matter whether you are making a yeah. peripheral paracentesis to go into the wound? You yeah. already have a perforation. The organism can anyway access the anterior chamber. Okay. So you are basically uh, yeah. putting uh, an yeah. air bubble yeah. to allow you to put the glue in a proper manner. Because it will polymerize the moment it comes in contact with the liquid. So my second question is regarding this amount of a perforation or a... Also, yeah, 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 yeah. with the medical yeah, medication, yeah, what amount yeah, of a visual yeah, activity we can perceive, uh, acquire? Or it should be taken for dial called PKP yeah, yeah, yeah. instead of I'm a medical okay, okay. I'm, I'm, there's too much Yeah, there's so much of ego. Question. Sir, can you please repeat your question? With the same amount of perforation okay. in the cornea, say 2 to 3 millimeter, yeah. the medical management, is, is it going to give us a good visual recovery versus dial called PKP in these patients? Because most of these patients with ulcer, when they are referred to a PKP surgery, it would be in a bad situation. What I'm going to say is, uh, is it we should refer these patients in earlier stages? Because this amount of perforation will not give us a good vision. Well, yeah. yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah that's true. Like, uh, uh, if it's a central perforation, you can do a nice graft which will give uh, visual rehabilitation as well. But if it's in the periphery, you can do a patch, you can do glue, you can do whatever. Sometimes if you feel that the infection is, you know, a little widespread and the uh, the cornea is angry looking in such cases you would try, try to buy time so that you know put glue 
maintain the chamber, reduce the infection, and then go ahead and do a keratoplasty so that the post graft infection will be less. So all these things we have to titrate and we have to judge based on I mean, individual cases. Thank you. See the the disadvantage in doing a full thickness graft in that scenario is that one you are worried about recurrence of the infection. Second, you cannot use steroids post op, so your graft survival may be limited. You know. So that is one thing. So surgery is always done when the integrity of the globe is compromised. So you always try to manage by non-surgical means. Yes. So uh, I just wanted wa to ask one question. When you're applying glue, sir, uh, on the perforation using that plastic disc, uh, should we put a BCL at the end or is the surface smooth no, we, enough? No, we do put a BCL at the end. Even oh. if the surface is smooth, <coughs> still it produces a lot of irritation. And the sir, second thing is the movement of the lid can dislodge the BCL as well. So you want to keep a bandage contact lens. So does it affect the drug penetration, sir, with the uh, presence of BCL, sir? Uh, it depends on what kind of indications. If you are doing it for a fungal keratitis, maybe if you have a BCL, maybe you'll try to use more of voriconazole than natamycin because that's going to stick. But in a bacterial keratitis with antibiotics, it shouldn't be a problem. Thank you, sir. So uh, another point in the in this that regarding BCL, when it, you are removing the BCL in the OR when it is stick, again keep on BCL in your hand because the surface will be so rough. Correct. The, you put a BCL for five seven days and remove it because the epithelialization will be very fast. Uh, please, sir. Uh, you said this is, uh, the cause of all this problem is fungal keratitis. Post-op, did you continue with antifungal and for how long? Post-op, post-op, post-op. Post-op, for the, following... For, for therapeutic PK. Lamellar keratoplasty. Lamellar keratoplasty, yes. Post, post so, so it's important. I, I don't recommend lamellar keratoplasty in fungal keratitis in our scenario. But for the reports that have been published this, this in literature, what they have intervene much earlier before the fungal keratitis has gone too deep or it has spread laterally I know. and they have continued at least three weeks post-op and they have sent the tissue for histopath to ensure that the posterior and the lateral margin whether it's involved or it's free continue topical and systemic yes. or just systemic or, or just topical usually they have continued with the topical because this was not a deep keratitis, so they have continued with topical medications. Thank you. Yeah, usually I, I would say to two to three weeks is the average duration after which you can try to dislodge the glue. It also depends on the size of the perforation that you have managed. Sometimes by looking at the surrounding area, looking at the vascularization, if the eye is very quiet, most of the time when you go and you, if you remove the contact lens and you just touch the glue, you will find that it's already moving, so you can gently remove it. But if it is very firmly fixed, I would leave it there for some more time. Rajesh, post-op, like you said, we should continue which drug, natamycin or voriconazole, because natamycin doesn't have penetration. I would continue with voriconazole and give some oral uh, ketoconazole or something like that. Fortified voriconazole. Yeah. And second thing, there is any role of AC wash in fungal keratitis? Like I said that lamellar keratoplasty wouldn't be for cases where there is a lot of exudates in the anterior chamber. I would, I would, I, I don't usually do lamellar keratoplasty for fungal keratitis. And the question is that one patient having 5mm, 6mm, hypo one, would you do keratoplasty or you do AC wash and wait for sometimes either response? Well, if you have a deep, you will try all the other measures as I mentioned in Namrata's paper of try doing targeted therapy of giving intrastromal or intracameral. So by non-surgical non means, you will try to resolve. And if it doesn't, then as a last resort, you will do a surgical intervention. Thank you. Yes, my question is in the role of itraconazole as the adjuvant of uh, antifungal or a first-line therapy. It's, it's not a... Mm, mm. So fast line drug is, as I said, that it is natamycin in most of the cases, except if you are sure that it is candida, you may choose voriconazole or amphotericin B. When it is not responding to your treatment, say for 10 days, 14 days, fungal ulcer is a game of, say, 
six weeks to three months. It is not a five days game. So you will remember that, you will realize that it is not responding. Then you have two options. Either you can add another topical antifungal or you can give systemic antifungal depending upon the depth, size and location of the ulcer. Suppose the ulcer is near the limbus, peripheral, the vascularity helps to, if you give systemic antifungal, that helps to reach at the site. Otherwise, you give two antifungals and combination of a pollen and azole group. So that is one thing. So, But systemic antifungal, you must be very careful. You have to go for liver function test and kidney function test, all that. Many of our, these patients are farmer and old group of patient. I mean, age-wise, they are old. So they are, these two status should be very good before you start antifungal agent. So it is not an antifungal agent when you start oral, it should be go for three weeks, two weeks, three weeks, even more. So sometimes you have to take this because one eyed patient, you do not have, uh, you don't want to do immediate intervention like therapeutic keratoplast. We always want that it should heal fast, then you can plan your keratoplasty properly. A dose of systemic itraconazole 200 mg each. Dose, dose of a systemic itraconazole 200 mg. BID or OD? Yeah, there, there are many, many views that initially itraconazole. Yes. Sir. Itraconazole starting loading dose is BID. four times QID. Then you go for BID, BID, other doses. And again, it is very toxic. No, that way you choose better ketaconazole, which is less. Sir, itraconazole is hugely toxic. Though some some paper says that it is act more, I mean, beneficial, but patient cannot tolerate. And a lot of trouble happens, systemic problem. So those things should be kept in mind. And always remember another thing we have forgotten any, the diabetic status of this patient is very, very important while treating a corneal ulcer, whatever mode you are. It, you are treating and patient is 400 blood sugar. That will not help your response actually. Thank you. Sir. And always ask your patient to, at least in our kind of practice, we ask the patient to bring the bring back the drops. So by looking at the amount of drops that are left behind, you know how frequently he's putting the drops. You may ask him, are you putting every hourly? They will say yes. But if you look at the remaining drop, you find the bottle is still full. If he's applying one hourly, it cannot be. So I think that compliance of therapy is also very important that you need to figure out. Compliance is a big issue in fungal corneal ulcer because, and they have to go back to field. So they work in paddy field again with fungal ulcer on. So sometimes we have patient, one eye I am treating, the patient coming with the other eye ulcer. Because we, we give absolute three days home rest because he has to put the drop one hourly. So that is very, very important. I've, I've started. Uh, I've started color coding the bottles. I have these colored stickers. So a lot of the patients, even if you write a prescription and give them, and you give them four or five medications to apply, including anti-glaucoma or cycloplegics, they confuse that, and sometimes they may be putting the cycloplegics every hourly or the refresh tears every hourly, and not realizing which is the bottle which is the most important. So we apply a red sticker on the antibiotic or the antifungal and tell them this is the bottle. This is the, uh, that's how they remember. They remember the medication by the color of the bottle. They, they don't read the name of it. The so I think it's important. Bigger, that bigger issue. Compliance is a very important factor whenever you're treating microbial keratitis. Yeah, that's true. I've also noted many times they say green bottle and red bottles. Yeah, there are educated, even a lot of educated that patients. Another that. point to add, if you see the natamycin of different companies, say, Eight companies have natamycin. You put the natamycin in your, you, you can go. Put here and see the consistency. See the thing. And sometimes you will see it is not coming out of the bottle. Lots of questions. It's so thick. Yes, yes, sir. It, it, it was a small point, but if you, if you are going to continue treatment of the antifungal antibacterial keratitis, but you, you have a thin cornea going to be thinner and thinner and you are afraid of perforation. 
can you can you put uh, contact lens during this time of uh, medical or topical treatment this this will help to prevent perforation and at the same time it will be uh, allow like for the medical treatment to uh, to go to the cornea surface maybe maybe i would consider this for a bacterial keratitis for which i already have identified the organism and i know the sensitivity yeah. and the patient is already responding to the initial therapy and during the course of the treatment if i find that the surface is thinning and you know there may be a perforation maybe i'll put but under close obs observation i'm not going to put the lens and send the patient away and see later yeah okay. otherwise we can look at other options of putting an amniotic membrane Tarsal. to protect the surface, tarsography, or think about doing a conjunctival flap itself in the periphery. Okay, thank you so much. Nice for that. Okay, so uh, good morning everyone. I'll be talking to you about a keratitis, which is uh, fortunately not that very common, but unfortunately it is diagnosed only after the patient has been treated for uh, for other uh, uh, microbes many a times. Only sometimes when you take a meticulous history and it has been attended very well, then you get to know that yes, probably it can be a canthamoeba and for that you need to have the highest degree of suspicion. For that you have to understand that most of these uh, patients, they are contact lens users, particularly uh, uh, who don't maintain the contact lens properly. I would say contact lens abusers rather than contact lens users because uh, they sleep with contact lens they swim with contact lens, they don't make, do care and maintenance. Uh, sometimes for orthokeratology, people have used uh, homemade uh, saline tap water they have used to clean the lens. All sorts of things has happened. Or sometimes it can also ha happen to a farmer as well. Apart from fungal keratitis, he can have an anthemoeba keratitis because of trauma to the surface of the eye, uh, contamination with brackish water, contaminated water, and that can be uh, a reason. Uh, why I said tap water? Because uh, this was one study which was published from UK wherein they studied the tap water and uh, found out that nearly 80% of the tap water had some amount of uh, 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 these uh, parasites, the canthamoeba. And, and you can understand that, uh, you know, in tropical countries it can be even higher. So, uh, a canthamoeba keratitis mostly is unilateral. It is associated with severe pain particularly in immunocompetent patients, those who are diabetic, those who are having HIV, those who are in any way immunosuppressed, then they can have painless acanthamoeba keratitis as well. And redness, photophobia, blurring as in any coronal ulcer. So when hardly you get to see patients in their early stage, uh, because many times the patient comes to us uh, after getting some treatment or uh, after showing somewhere. But initial cases, you can get some epithelial irregularity. You can have some uh, dentity form appearance. And uh, you can also have patchy stromal infiltrates, you can have radial uh, perineural infiltrates, but in large majority of cases, patients come uh, with uh, ring ulcers, with total corneal staining and uh, epithelial defect, with inflammation. Uh, a couple of decades back, whenever we used to see inflammation in the eye, we always used to feel that uh, uh, it can be either viral, it can be bacterial, but in acanthamoeba also, there's a lot of inflammation that can be seen. There can be anterior chamber reaction, there can be scleritis, limbitis, all sorts of things. And ring infiltrate is something which can be seen in acanthamoeba as well as pseudomonas keratitis. Now, the difference that you can make out from, uh, differentiate between these two is by the history that in pseudomonas keratitis, it will be a very f rapidly growing uh, and fastly progressing uh, ring infiltrate and lead to uh, rapid ulceration and perforation. But in acanthamoeba, it is a slowly progressive uh, condition. And as such, ulcer does not have that much of uh, vascularization, but it can be associated with scleritis and limbitis, wherein you can have, uh, where you, in you can have vascularization. Now you can see this is an example of an acanthamoeba creditis post uh, refractive surgery. 
it started with this ring infiltrate you can see here the ring like appearance and then the total epithelial defect is having then the patient had nodules in the sclera and it went on progressing from one nodule which became atrophic then it uh, in adjacent area there were nodule and gradually there was a 360 degree thinning in this case uh, as far as diagnosis is concerned, it can be done by uh, meticulous history taking, by the symptoms of the patient and also by corneal scraping and uh, uh, by confocal microscopy as well. So in confocal microscopy, you can get to see thickened nerves and uh, uh, you can uh, see the uh, uh, double walled cyst as well as trophozoites. So you can see the thickened nerves. And then as you move further anterior, you can see double walled cysts in the stroma. And as you further come anteriorly, you can get to see these uh, refractile trophozoites in the basal epithelium of the, of the uh, cornea, of the ulcer. And uh, uh, when you stain with calcofluor white, you get to see these apple green fluorescence and you can, all these double wall cysts can be stained nicely with pass as well. Although the trophozoites are not the ones that can be detected so easily. As far as culture is concerned, it is uh, culture in non-nutrient agar with uh, live or killed gram-negative bacilli. The basic idea is that acanthamoeba eats up these uh, uh, gram-negative bacilli and that's what you get depressions or trails in the, in the uh, culture plate. But as you, uh, but, but even in macrophages, etc., you can have these depressions. But on serial transfer, again, if it's causing these depressions in the next uh, plate as well, then that is suggestive of uh, acanthamoeba. And PCR again is a very sensitive tool to diagnose. As far as uh, treatment is concerned, aggressive treatment has to be done by use of bigonides and diamidines. Chlorhexidine 0.02% or polyhexamethylene bigonide 0.02% can be used and propamidine 0.1%. Both can be combined, initially can be given hourly and then gradually you can reduce the frequency. Uh, you can use systemic therapy with azoles. And uh, another drug which is now uh, coming up and started uh, becoming popular uh, is miltifosin. It is an anti-Lishmania drug and there was uh, some animal study in which it uh, showed that uh, systemic uh, miltifosin as well as even topical has also been used uh, have some uh, good effect in, uh, in acanthamoeba. Uh, there are studies which have shown uh, good results. There are uh, reports of, uh, of uh, in severe intense inflammation as well as limbal and scleral necrosis also happening after addition of miltifosin. So that is why there are few case reports only, but it is not yet considered as an established modality. It can be used as an adjunctive additional uh, therapy if it is uh, not responding, a proven case of acanthamoeba is not responding to bigonide uh, uh, and uh, propamidine. There are studies, they have also shown that points, instead of 0.02% of chlorhexidine, they have used 0.06% for some time with good results and then they reduce to 0.02%. So all these things can be done. As far as steroid is concerned, uh, it is usually not given, but if there is a scleritis, if there is a VIT, you can give steroid but nicely undercover with uh, bigonides uh, so that you can uh, have suppression of inflammation. Uh, as far as the, uh, the uh, scleritis is concerned, uh, systemic steroid is of course it is useful, it can be given initially but mycophenolate uh, has been found to be quite effective. So the usual dosage, dosage schedule will be 500 milligram twice a day initially to start with. Then you increase it to 1 gram twice a day and then you increase it to 1.5 gram twice a day. And then later on you can reduce depending upon the response. Uh, uh, supportive therapy in terms of cycloplegic and anti-glaucoma has to be given in as in any other keratitis. What is most important that many of these patients have severe pain, very severe pain you have to give NSAIDs to reduce the pain. If it is not responding to NSAIDs, you have to give sometimes uh, these opioids, tramadol, etc.
and a couple of patients i have used these patches also of lignocaine and amitriptyline patches have been used to reduce the pain because patient is in intense pain and uh, always complaining so you have to take care of that uh, cxl and ptk have been used in one or two case reports uh, not very effective as far as uh, uh keratoplasty is concerned the risk of uh, uh, recurrence is very high so if you are planning to do a lamellar keratoplasty it should be done uh, you have to judge it that it is not responding in the initial stage then you may go ahead but it is always advisable to control the infection first to uh, to a great extent and then only go ahead with any sort of keratoplasty so thank you very much for your patient listening any uh, suggestion any anything you would like to add yeah yes sir sorry lignocaine patch yeah it is uh, it is available you just have to put it uh, over the skin somewhere and that uh, there is sustained release and that uh, reduces the pain yeah like when yeah 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 Some problem audio visual. What's the question? Like, right? <laughs> yeah. So we move on to the next uh, topic, which again is the last question for managing. It. All your medications, or if the integrity of the globe is likely to be compromised, you fall back on surgical options. I had covered something about lamellar keratoplasty, and we have now. Professor Jeevan Tithyal, who will be talking about therapeutic keratoplasty in microbial keratitis. Uh, by the time he puts up his slides, I know you have a lot of experience on lamellar keratoplasties in keratitis. So, what is your experience in uh, acanthamoeba? When would you like to do? Maybe you can give some initial loading dose of uh, antimicrobial and then do it. Or uh, yeah, I what think, is? I think I would give antimicrobial so therapy for two weeks. And in two weeks, if I don't see my patient responding, I, I will have a very low tolerance for doing a lamellar keratoplasty because the patient is very symptomatic and you not every case of acanthamoeba keratitis responds very well to PHMB or chlorine. Very true. But if you true. wait for the infection to go up to the limbus then, or it goes too deep, then you have already lost Check the battle. And, and, and doing a penetrating keratoplasty in like that it. scenario oh, yeah. does not give you great results. Let's come, let's come. Sure. Thank Rather, you. Thank you, Rajesh. And uh, no, no, uh, I'll just go briefly through the you know basic aspects of therapeutic keratoplasty in these uh, infectious keratitis cases, and what should be our way to handle these cases. You have heard uh, various speaker before; they would have covered uh, most of the time the indication, decision making, surgical technique, and most importantly, the post-op management <laughs> and outcome is very important in, in these cases with you know therapeutic grafts. All cases where uh, Dr. Rajesh talked about, if uh, things are not going appropriately in terms of management with the medical treatment, then you require a th surgical intervention to be done, uh, especially perforated corneal ulcer, non-healing corneal ulcer for a long, long time, or a neurotrophic keratitis. And if you look into a various institution where they have, you know, number of surgeries, uh, large number of surgeries, almost 30 to 40 percent cases will be a therapeutic keratoplasties. Therefore, it is important for, uh, you know, people who are working in a corneal field to understand and to learn the uh, art of therapeutic keratoplasty because this surgery may be more difficult, more challenging than the routine keratoplasty as such. It has to be done more meticulously and more effectively for a patient's benefit. If you know the number of cases requiring therapeutic keratoplasty, the largest will be a bacterial corneal ulcer, but you, ha you still have fungal, viral, acanthamoeba into that group. But more important one is a group of cases where you had a culture negativity. You see here, culture negative cases are 30 to 40 percent in our series. If you have a case where repeated cultures are negative, these are cases they are not going to respond to your medical treatment. Ultimately, they may require therapeutic, therapeutic keratoplasty as such. So I think this particular point of decision making is very important. Don't wait for a too long 
where the you know ulcer become too large, reaches periphery, involves the limbus sclera, then your outcomes are very very poor. Some patient may have a very deep uh, involvement and may go into endophthalmitis. So you have to make a decision early enough and counsel your patient, record the pre-op findings, continue treatment and don't wait for good quality donor tissue if you don't get. Any quality of tissue will be useful for uh, safeguarding the globe and improving the outcome for these patients. Idea here is to get rid of infection save the integrity of GLOW and make sure patient has, if you have a good outcome, patient may have a vision also. Therefore, as I told, timing of a surgery is very important. Early intervention before it goes to a difficult situation is going to help in these cases. So this is a video I have uh, got it from Dr. Rajesh Sinha. This is a perforated corneal also patient. You have to make a trephination very effectively because these are soft eyes, perforated eyes. You need to have a sharp definition, make sure you have a peripheral groove, involve the entire area of infection and go beyond that. At least one millimeter beyond the infected area has to be taken care of. Make a light penetration, don't damage the underneath structures. If needed, you can use a viscoelastic also. Make sure your trephination is such, which is around 70 to 80 percent. Never try to go full thickness in these cases. And subsequently, manage the entire graft in a way and remove the inflammatory markers and sometimes you have a lot of uh, membranes coming up and that membrane should be gently separated even you may have a little uh, bleeding coming up make sure you open the peripheral area by putting a little viscoelastic underneath the uh, remaining uh, host area then suturing has to be uh, interrupted suture in these cases you may do a, at least one or two peripheral aridectomy to safeguard the pupillary block happening in these patients because there's a high chance you may have these also. So this is one case where you have done a graft. As I said, the area of infection should be taken care of. Go beyond the infection at least one millimeter all around. Once you have a graft in your hand, make a three sections, one for a histopath, one for a bacterial, one for a you know, fungal or other uh, uh, investigation which may require for these cases. So apart from the cultures, histopath is also important because that will going to enhance your outcome or a diagnosis of organism is much better. This, this is one case. This is after almost 16 months. The therapeutic graft has acted like an optical graft because we did the surgery little early in these patients. You can see this is one patient where the infection is too large and this is the graft which is post-op and ultimately it will become hazy. So in, initiation is also very important and this is superficial uh, epithelial defect happening after the graft. Normally, therapeutic grafts are larger. The limbal stem cells may have got damage in these patients. Epithelialization is a problem. Always make sure epithelialization is uh, done faster. Avoid uh, toxic medications if possible because antibacterial has to be given in these patients. This is a very, very large ulcer. This is what happens uh, after one year. At least we have saved the globe from infection. This patient is suitable for optical graft now. Early intervention, good results. This is one more patient, immediate after surgery. This is after six months. The results are pretty good in these cases. The important issue is to examine these patients subsequently also because recurrence is very, very common in these patients. And that may be in the host graft junction area, near the suture area, or sometimes entire the graft can get infected. In a lamellar procedures, the interface infection is very, very important in these patients. If you have virulent organisms, more chances of recurrence happening. If not appropriately remove the entire infected area, recurrence chances are much better in these cases. Lamellar graft, Dr. Rajesh has covered beautifully. I'll just uh, take out this particular area where you have a thin area, desmotor seal. You don't have to do a full thickness keratoplasty here. You can do a dark and results are quite effectively good in these patients. In terms of post-op management, I think you should understand the uh, bacterial keratitis, all cases you have to continue the antimicrobials because that is classically recommended and should be done in these patients. What about uh, steroids is another consideration which should also be looked into these patients. I would say as soon as possible you should start antimicrobials, steroids, bacterial ulcer, you can start immediately within the first day also. Fungal keratitis, wait for at least one or two weeks till there's no recurrence, epithelize, and you can start steroid if there's inflammation going on. Viral keratitis can be given safely. Acanthiba, again, you have to wait and watch. If too much inflammation, as Dr. Rajesh Sinha to told us, you can start steroid there also. Cycloplegics, tear substitute, anti medication has to be given in the, all these patients. 
In terms of outcome wise, we all know bacterial keratitis has a best outcome than uh, viral and fungal. Because fungal will have a, a least outcome which is effective enough to decrease the recurrence wise. Because recurrence chances are very high with the fungal corneal ulcers and effectively the antifungal treatment has to go for a very, very long time. For acanthamoeba also, it may be six months to one year. Same thing holds for antifungals also. After the completion of uh, your surgery, maybe antifungal goes for uh, at least four to six weeks. This is one concept we have developed. If you cross-link your donor corneas, effectivity of this cornea may be much more. We found that the clarity of a tissue and the recurrence of infection was less if you use the cross-linked donor cornea for the therapeutic grafts, especially in the fungal corneal ulcers. To summarize, we know that therapeutic keratoplasty is necessity in those cases where you could not manage the medical treatment. Or you feel that despite your medical treatment, the disease is progressing. And associated problems are also there where you think patient has a systemic immunocompromised situation where infection is not going to handle then you must do a therapeutic graft in time don't wait for too long otherwise your results are going to be poor antimicrobial treatment has to be given pre-op pre-surgery and post-surgery also in fungal corneal ulcer wait for uh, at least two weeks for a starting steroid in these patients thank you for your kind listening Okay, uh, so uh, as uh, we have already reached our uh, reached 11.55, so we have to wrap up the session. So I would like to thank all the speakers, uh, Professor Tityal, Dr. Uh, Fogla, Dr. Basak, Dr. Namrata, and uh, would like to thank all the uh, all our colleagues who are sitting here who have very nicely participated in this course and have, we had a wonderful interaction and there was a take home message for all of us. So thank you very much.